I try to get somebody really special for the occasion. And I'm very proud that this year it indeed worked out very nicely to get Manolis here. Uh, he has really been in the genomics field forever. And he's a fantastic scientist and speaker. So this couldn't really be any better. And maybe even if you've seen him and on podcast, he's also very, very entertaining outside of that. So uh, really a pleasure to have him all around here. Um, I will also say a little bit about his CV. Um, but, you know, if I would just start with undergrad and grad and assistant professor and et cetera, et cetera, it would probably be quite boring because it says MIT, 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 MIT. So my nose has been literally at MIT for all of the stages of his career. But that does not mean he's boring, as you probably guessed. So he was born in Greece. Um, and then his family moved to France when he was 12. So he's also fluent in French. And then only for high school came to the US. And so he really, uh, he's very good at crossing boundary. Uh, you may also notice uh, he speaks both fluently biology and computer science. So he's trained as a computer scientist, but he's really, really deeply immersed in biology and really trying to get at the biology, not just developing uh, technology. So that's been really, really great. And ever since I've known him, in fact, it's been like that. Uh, we met, I think you were, an, you were no, you were a graduate student uh, aligning yeast genomes back then. So this was, and you know, at the time, this was actually really difficult. And there weren't that many sequencing data out there. So what you did is you aligned genomes and you asked like, well, how do I even align it properly so that you get synteny, that you can align the regulatory regions on top of each other. And so you can extract information about their conservation. So this was really cool and new. And the only reason I'm saying this is because you can see then how far genomics has come. And so what he's doing now, of course, again, is the latest exciting stuff. And uh, as you'll see, really, it, the, the whole field has boomed since then. I mean, what we can do now with genomics technology in terms of experiments and even applying it to human disease is really, really amazing. And, and so Manolis has always been at the forefront trying to get at the latest. And I think he's still preparing slide to make sure it really is the latest. <laughs> so, so with this, I, I won't take any more of your time and, um, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Ilya. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And in fact, you know what? I'm gonna do something a little non-traditional, which is I'm actually gonna paste my slide deck into the chat. So you guys can actually look ahead at the slides and ask me any kind of detailed question on it. Uh, so Yulia, I've known Yulia for a long time, and she's an awesome scientist, always been at the top, top notch. She has an awesome brain and awesome hands, which make a big difference. And But she's also got a, a, an awesome heart. So she's an awesome human being, and it's a real pleasure to be both your colleague uh, and your friend. So thank you so much for the very, very kind invitation. I have the Deutsch studio auch five years long. Y también hablo un poco de español, podemos hacer eso en cada lengua del mundo. Te doy leche panda, te doy cala. So, uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, our work on trying to understand the molecular basis of human disease. And this is a place where the impact on um, translation is enormous, but the challenge in basic science is enormous. That's why I'm sort of, I feel privileged to be able to speak to the STARS Institute because you guys are one of the few places that truly, truly deeply appreciates the power of basic foundational biology and why it's so darn important in understanding human disease. And what I'm gonna be focusing on today is how do we dissect and manipulate disease circuitry at single cell resolution and how, we tr how do we translate genomic insight in insights into uh, therapeutic targets and manipulation. It all starts with human genetics. Why human genetics? Because when you carry out a genome-wide association study, and I'm showing here the Manhattan plot for obesity. So BMI, body mass index, is a very good measure of obesity. And here I'm showing a, a genome-wide association study. And this is called the Manhattan plot because you can see all these tall buildings throughout and these super, super tall skyscrapers, uh, you know, sprinkled in. And this is basically a very simple chi-square statistical, statistical test that simply asks for every SNP in the genome. And it's, it's ridiculous that this even works. A lot of critics basically said, oh, 
GWAS will never work. And boy, were they wrong. But the insight is that a single genetic variant, a single non-coding variant can have an effect that is visible all the way at the disease end. And, and that distance is enormous because there are thousands of variants, as we now understand, that are each influencing disease a tiny little amount. But what's really remarkable is that these variants do exist. And in fact, that common genetic variation is indeed associated with observable phenotypic changes all the way to the disease phenotype. And what you see here is a GWAS from 2010, but this locus here, FTO, was discovered in 2007. So for 13 years now, we've known that the strongest genetic association with obesity lies in the middle of a gene called FTO. So that was the promise of genetics, that we were going to sort of understand the disease mechanism, reveal new target genes, build new therapeutics, and, enable, and, and ultimately enable um, precision medicine and also personalized medicine by understanding the genetic risk of each person and sort of tuning the therapies this way, and also precision medicine by understanding what are the places where we should be intervening. So that's all nice and rosy, and it turns out that GWAS works, but there's a challenge. The challenge is that when you open up the hood in this FTO locus right here, you see that there is indeed uh, 89 common variants, not one. You see this you know, long, long stretch of genetic variants. Every single one of these loci has the same picture. And the reason for that is that genetics works through blocks of inheritance. You don't just inherit one SNP from your uh, mom or your dad in any one location. You inherit a huge chunk of the genome. This is 50,000 nucleotides, which forms a single chunk between these recombination uh, hotspots here caused by PRDM9 binding the genome and creating these double-stranded breaks, which then lead to recombination during meiosis in hotspots over generations, leading to these hotspots of recombination uh, where these blocks are effectively inherited as a unit. So it's very hard to distinguish within this block the causal variant. And that's the first challenge. The second challenge is that in many cases, there are multiple genes underlying this region of association. So people are like, oh, great, uh, which of these genes is it? And they make a guess as to what gene is it is. So then it's not really that we're going to be identifying new targets completely de novo. The third challenge is that even when there's a single gene in the association, in this particular case, FTO is the only gene in this region of association. Even when there's a single gene, you don't actually know that it's the target gene. And the reason for that is that in 93% of cases, none of the genetic variants actually perturbs the protein. And that's something that most people haven't fully embraced, haven't fully conceptualized. GWAS, genome-wide association studies, capture common variants and their effects are generally very small because if a variant perturbs a gene directly, if it perturbs a protein directly, that protein will probably have a strong effect on the phenotype. And if it's a detrimental effect, evolutionary selection will actually weed it out of the population. So what you end up with is selection trimming the total effect that you can have on the phenotype. And that would lead to GWAS having this huge number of weak effects because any one of the strong effects has been sort of, you know, chopped off by natural selection. As soon as it rises too high of a frequency, if it's high effect size, it's trimmed off. So that basically results in weak effect variants. And these weak effects variants are enormously enriched for um, uh, non-coding regions. So basically the 93% of them are in non-coding regions. To make a long story short, FTO, it turns out, has nothing to do with obesity. This locus is obviously important, as the genetics points out, but the gene that happens to also be encoded in that locus is unrelated to obesity. Instead, the target genes are multiple genes over through a long-range interaction of this control region to a bunch of target genes, two, two, two different target genes, 1.2 million nucleotides and 500,000 nucleotides away. So that's the challenge that we're going to have to face. And that's why my group has been working on the circuitry of the genome for a long time uh, through comparative genomics, as Julia mentioned, for understanding what are the motifs underlying 
uh, you know, human functional variation. And what are the building blocks? What, what are even the genes? We recently published a paper showing that a bunch of previously thought to be non-coding loci are in fact in new genes that no one had actually previously noticed before because we've developed methods that are sort of much more sensitive and these genes were kind of small and so on and so forth. So basically, the, number one, the target gene is not known. Number two, the causal variant is not known. Number three, the cell type of action is not known. So genetics has the huge advantage that it will reveal the genetic basis of disease. As Ed Lewis uh, likes to say, um, even if genes were ma made out of green cheese, genetics will work. So basically genetics doesn't, doesn't care about the mechanism. It'll tell you that something is associated regardless of the mechanism. But the challenge of course, is that if you don't know the, uh, you know, the mechanism, you won't know how and why and where to intervene. So basically the cell type of action could be anywhere in the body. With obesity, it could be the brain, it could be the liver, it could be your metabolism, it could be your gut, it could be anywhere. Uh, and therefore the relevant pathways are also not known if you don't know the gene, the cell type or the, uh, or the variant and the mechanism is not known. So that's what we're trying to remedy in my group. And the, the, the approach that we're taking is we're starting with human genetics to reveal both common and of course, rare variants and regions of association. And then we're profiling RNA transcription and epigenomic variation across lots of healthy individuals to understand how genetic variation in general affects these intermediate molecular phenotypes, but also in the context of disease to look for both genetic drivers of disease, but also other changes that are associated with the disease, even if they're not directly genetically driven, because it can tell us about disease mechanism more broadly. And number three, we then computationally integrate these data sets to predict driver genes, regions, uh, and cell types. And then we validate the predictions using human cells and also increasingly mouse models. And then we disseminate the results and start all over again. The goal is to basically go from a region of association, which is simply saying something is happening here, to a circuitry of association, which tells us exactly what are the genetic variants that are underlying this association. What are the enhancers within which these genetic variants are lying? What are the tissues and cell types where these enhancers are active? What are the motifs that are disrupted by these genetic variants? And what are the regulators that bind these motifs? And what are the target genes downstream of these enhancer and promoter regions? So all of that is basic foundational science. Uh, all of that is sort of understanding the basic circuitry of the genome and that's a building block that's a foundation for understanding genetic associations and ultimately the mechanism of disease. So I'm going back to that FTO locus. This is you know, the, the, the paper where we dissected it and we basically say FTO obesity variant circuitry and adipocyte browning in humans, dissecting effectively this you know, puzzle that had remained open for nearly 10 years since the association was first discovered. What we find is a circuit that doesn't even involve the FTO gene. This genetic variant, RS1421085, is disrupting the motif for the arid 5 b regulator that normally binds this massive 12 kb super enhancer sitting in the, in the first 10 kb of that 50 kb association. When that regulator normally binds that super enhancer, it represses that super enhancer, which in turn represses IRX3 and IRX5 that are sitting 600,000 and 1.2 million nucleotides away. What do these genes do? After a lot of work, we figured out that these genes are in fact master regulators of metabolism that were previously not known. What they do is they regulate the switch between thermogenesis or lipogenesis. Thermogenesis is the process of heat generation, thermal heat generation genesis. So, uh, through, so, so our fat cells are actually your best friends. Everybody says, oh, I have too much fat. No, fat is your best friend. Without all your fat, your lipids would be, you know, disrupting all your, your cellular process across your body. Your fat is actually storing uh, your, your fat cells are storing all of these lipids that would ha wreak havoc inside your body otherwise. That's number one. Number two, they're your best friends because they can save energy for a rainy day. And it was extremely advantageous, uh, you know, evolutionarily a long time ago 
to have a lot of storage of calories when you don't spend them during the day so that you can spend them when you don't have food anymore. Of course, today, you know, that's not so great anymore. And then uh, your, your fat cells are also the ones that can burn calories. So thermogenesis is a process through which your brown fat and your beige fat can actually generate heat to number one, heat up your body. Number two, dissipate energy that is just not needed to be stored. So normally IRX3 and RX5 turn off thermogenesis and turn on lipogenesis. And when you uh, manage to repress them, then you can switch to the lean phenotype of thermogenesis. But when they are de-repressed by the mutation here, these genes are in fact leading to the loss of thermogenesis in uh, the risk individuals. So why are we so excited about that having that circuitry? Number one, we understand the mechanism better, but number two, it gives us a place to intervene. We can now downregulate or downregulate uh, or overexpress RX5B, downregulate or overexpress either IRX3 or IRX5. And we can even use genome editing to go and switch between the risk and the non-risk uh, allele at this locus. And what we find in each case is an incredible switch going back and forth between lean and obese. What we find is that changing a single nucleotide variant out of 3.2 billion nucleotide variants in the, in the human genome, we can basically go and edit this one SNP, RS1421085, and restore the AT-rich motif by changing it from a C back into a T. And what we're finding is that this completely restores the process of thermogenesis measured as oxygen consumption rate uncoupled as a percent of basal, which is the oxygen burning. And in the unstimulated condition versus, and in the stimulated condition, you can basically see that the uh, effect of thermogenesis is sevenfold increased. I mean, remember before how I was saying, wow, you know, these genetic variants that are, you know, single nucleotides, how can they have such a strong effect? Well, this is a dramatic effect. This is a twofold increase. This is a master regulator, master enhancer of a, a lot of, you know, super, super centrally important genes. And that's why it has such an enormous effect. When we take IRX3 now, one of the two target genes, and we repress it in the fat tissue of mice, what we see is that the fat stores of the mice are completely depleted. You don't see you know, fat anymore. When you open up these mice, they just don't have any fat. They've lost 50% of their body weight. They start out leaner than the normal mice. But what's really remarkable is that when you put them on a high fat diet, the normal mice gain weight, but these IRX3 dominant negative mice are unable to gain weight. They're not changing their diet. They're not changing their exercise. But what they do is that they simply burn calories when they're awake and also when they're sleeping. So we've basically managed to you know, go from a region of association with a completely unrelated gene into a circuitry, master regulators, a biological process, and the ability to intervene. So that's, that's what the goal of my team is. And that's what the goal of the field is. How do we translate now this enormous number of insights that can be gained from genome-wide association studies into actionable targets, which are these target genes, the regulators, the cell types, and also the biological processes. So what I'm gonna tell you today is how do we do this and what are the uh, directions that we're pursuing to do this systematically across thousands of loci uh, at the same time. <clears throat> so number one, how do we build reference epigenomes to predict disease relevant tissues? Number two, how do we combine genetic and epigenetic and transcriptional variation in the context of both healthy and disease individuals to understand causal genes and mediation of the genetic effects? Number three, how do we do all that at the single cell level through both epigenomic and transcriptional variation in single cell attack and single cell RNA? Then how do we understand cell type specific genetic effects by integrating single cell and bulk and GWAS and QTLs? Number five, how do we build these phenotypes across multiple uh, phenotypic signatures at the same time by combining medical records and expression variation and genetic variation? Number six, how do we now go from one tissue to many tissues? 
to understand the convergence of these pathways acting in multiple tissues together and build biomarkers across obesity, cancer, Alzheimer's, and aging. And number seven, how do we now build these high throughput tools for systematic gene regulatory circuitry dissection? And we have until 7 p.m., right, Julia? <laughs> I should be done by 6.30. We don't need to stay the whole time. All right, so let's now start with how do we build these reference epigenomes? So this is a work that we did in collaboration with an enormous number of awesome teams through the ENCODE project, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, and the Roadmap Epigenomics project, and more recently, this EpiMap project that combines Roadmap, um, ENCODE, and GGR. And what we basically looked at is how is the epigenome varying across uh, both uh, you know, adult and embryonic stage of development across uh, primary cells and in vitro differentiated cells from uh, both ES and IPS from these individuals, as well as multiple regions of the brain and multiple samples of blood, multiple cell types of blood sorted, and so on and so forth. And for each of those, we basically profiled promoter-associated marks, enhancer-associated marks, transcription-associated marks, polycom associated, uh, heterochromatin, as well as active marks of enhancers and promoters, and then uh, DNA accessibility, and of course, DNA methylation through whole genome bisulfite, and uh, lastly, the quote unquote output of RNA expression. This is what these maps look like across 127 cell types. You basically see these promoter regions here, which are extremely stable, these enhancer regions, which are much more dynamic. You see this repressed gene here in the middle, PAX5, which only turns on in like three or four cell types and you see this extremely dynamic view of the epigenome. But what the dynamics also allow you to do is actually start looking at correlations between non-coding regions and their target genes. So if I have a genetic variant here that turns on in this cell type, that cell type, and that cell type, I can be pretty excited that, wow, maybe I have some insight on the mechanism of action. But if you look at the nearby genes, none of these genes has an expression pattern that is similar to that uh, genes, uh, the enhancer regions activation. The only gene whose expression pattern matches the activation patterns of the enhancer is in fact sitting um, you know, half a megabase away through uh, multiple intervening genes. And it's again, PAX5 here. So notice that region turns on exactly when PAX5 turns on. So that suggests that the dynamic information allows us also to start linking together non-coding regions to their target genes. The other thing we do is that we systematically try to predict which enhancer classes are enriched systematically in these um, genetic variants. So every trait has a set of genome-wide locations that it's associated with. Here I'm showing both the haplotype blocks and the SNPs within them. And different loci have different sets of genomic annotations associated with them. So the question now is, can we now leverage multiple trains simultaneously and use them as controls for each other to basically compare them with the epigenomic information of which enhancers light up in each of these cell types? And what we can do is lay uh, on top of this all of the locations that are overlapping stem cell enhancers and say, which of these traits is enriched in stem cell enhancers? And what you find is that they localize specifically in height, suggesting that perhaps genetic variants associated with height are acting in early development. Similarly, immune uh, and so type one diabetes associated loci enrich in immune enhancers. Blood pressure associated loci enrich in heart enhancers. Cholesterol genetic variants localize in liver enhancers, enabling us to paint this diagonal of what traits are acting in what tissues. So we can look at that systematically to basically start predicting where every trait is acting. And some of the examples I've already pointed out in the cartoon in the previous picture, but you can see that height has no enrichment except for embryonic stem cells. All of these immune traits, huge enrichment for T cells and B cells. Blood pressure, again, no enrichment anywhere except for the left ventricle of the heart. That basically says that enhancers active in the left ventricle of the heart contain genetic variants associated with blood pressure. Again, all of this is about enhancers. We don't even look at the genes here. Fasting glucose related traits, for anyone who understands type two diabetes biology, you would make exactly one prediction, which is pancreatic islets. That's where the beta cells of the pancreatic islets are in fact getting you know, uh, bombarded and killed by an immune dysregulation uh, in type one diabetes or other kind of dysregulation in type two diabetes. 
For cholesterol, you see a very, very strong and clear and consistent association, whether you measure HDL or LDL with liver enhancers. So we can start putting some bets here. Inflammatory bowel disease, where would you put your bets? Inflammatory, oh, great, inflammatory. So immune cells, T cells, B cells, yep, sure enough. Bowel disease, well, let's look at digestive tissues. Wow, sure enough. So yeah, we just want some money, great. Let's put all our gains in Alzheimer's disease. Where would you put that? Uh, brain, uh, of course, Alzheimer's brain. Uh, <laughs> oops, we just lost all our gains. Uh, what's going on here? What goes on is that Alzheimer's is not associated with brain at all. Uh, what goes on? Is it that our textbook is wrong or is it that our methods are wrong? Is it that the data is wrong? None of the above. What actually happens is that brain is primarily composed of neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. 90% of brain is these three major cell types and of course, all of the subtypes of them. But the enrichment we're finding is for another cell type and specifically monocytes and CD14 plus cells. This is the same signature of the microglia. These are the immune cells that are resident inside your brain. And it turns out that the Alzheimer's association is extremely strong, but localizes specifically in immune cells and not at all in the neurons. To validate this, we basically went and sorted neurons, microglia, and also oligodendrocytes out of the brain. And what we built was these cell type specific chip seek maps of H3K27 acetylation. And what we found is that in fact, the neurons are not all in non enriched, they're actually depleted. And so are the oligodendrocytes. But in fact, the microglia is where all of the action is at. So that basically tells us that the uh, genetic variants of Alzheimer's are primarily acting through immune processes, not the same immune processes as T cells and B cells that you see here, but through monocytes and CD14 plus cells. And indeed our you know, paper basically says, conserve epigenomic signals in mice and humans reveal an immune basis of Alzheimer's disease. And that's five years ago. And that basically sort of caused this big shift in the field of Alzheimer's to basically now focus nearly entirely on microglia. And it also pushed us to basically start studying cells at single cell resolution, as I'm gonna be describing soon. Since then, we've expanded this work from 127 epigenomes to 834 epigenomes through this EpiMap project. Uh, and you, know, you can see here to scale the 127 that I showed you on the previous slide and the 834. We now find associations, not just in 54 traits, as I showed you earlier, but in now 534 traits. And these are extremely precise. They're basically giving us an enormous amount of insight into these complex traits. If you look at brain, you know, which was previously not super enriched in Alzheimer's, you now see that the enrichment is instead in psychiatric traits. So in schizophrenia, neuroticism, smoking, worry, you know, et cetera but also in educational abilities like math, educational attainment, measures of intelligence and so on and so forth. Uh, Alzheimer's is sitting here with a lot of other immune traits in uh, blood. You see kidney with filtering functions. You see liver with cholesterol. You see heart with uh, you know, diastolic pressure, blood pressure, et cetera. And then you also see these multifactorial traits. Every pie chart here represents the diversity of tissues within which a particular trait is uh, active. And you can see, for example, coronary artery disease is one of the most multifactorial traits that basically shows enrichment in multiple different types of tissues and cell types. But that allows us to now start dissecting coronary artery disease into its components. You basically see an association with liver, but also with coronary artery, with adipose, with you know gastric and aorta and placenta and so on and so forth. What's really cool is that we can take the subset of genetic loci associated with CAD and partition them according to the ones that are acting in liver or that are acting in coronary artery disease and et cetera. And what we're finding is that this partitioning gives you a different subset of gene ontology terms that are enriched with liver and a different set of go terms that are enriched with heart and so on and so forth. And indeed, if you look at the comorbidity and the co-association of multiple additional traits that are also co-enriched for the same loci, you get a different set of traits depending on the subset of uh, enhancers that you're looking at. So that allows us now to start peeling off the layers of complexity of these complex traits and um, understand it systematically. And we've now built resources to do that in the individual loci that are associated with disease. We now have the same 
CAD table, but now showing each of the loci associated with coronary artery disease and the uh, specific tissues that are enriched and which of these overlap these tissues and at what distance they lie. So here's the first example here. We see PCSK9, one of the best success stories of um, genetics, where we now have drugs that specifically target PCSK9. And you see indeed this association of these non-coding variants that are sitting here and in fact linked directly with the PCSK9 gene. As a second example, you can see the, uh, this locus here, EDNRA, doesn't show any overlap with liver, but it does show overlap with specifically the heart. And indeed, you see this very strong link to EDNRA, one of the heart-associated loci, uh, genes. And then you also see loci where it appears on the surface that liver is dominating, but in fact, you see links of both liver and heart and artery, which are uh, co-associated, suggesting both multi-gene and multi-tissue pleiotropy for the same genetic locus. You can see here that this is not a single association, it's multiple SNPs that are in fact falling, falling on multiple enhancers that are all linked to the same two target genes, both in heart and in liver. So we basically built this map uh, for uh, EpiMap that allows you to interactively explore both the circuitry of these loci, as well as the uh, association of these loci. And for 30,000 loci, we can now go in and say, this locus is sitting in a genome-wide enriched class of annotations, giving us confidence that we kind of can guess what are the tissues that this is acting in. So the website for that is, uh, if you just Google comp bio and epimap, you'll find it. All right, so that's the first part of using reference epigenomes to predict disease relevant tissues. But up until now, I've only used reference tissues as if every one of these Zoom call basically has the same, you know, I don't know, brain epigenome or the same heart epigenome. And that's bogus. I mean, my, my brain epigenome changes uh, from day to day and it also changes when I'm sick, it changes that age. And of course it changes enormously by my genetic variation. So what we'd like to do now is look at how this epigenome changes from person to person and how transcription changes from person to person and how that relates with both disease and genetics. So what we're trying to do is actually bridge the gap, which is enormous between genetic variants and disease. Instead of these hugely polygenic effects, which are minuscule in effect size, what we're going to be looking is intermediate phenotypes that are bridging that gap, where you can see that this genetic variant doesn't just act on Alzheimer's directly, but it acts in the brain in a specific enhancer, influencing the expression of a specific gene, which in turn has an impact on amyloid beta accumulation and you know, um, ultimately impacts Alzheimer's. But the challenge, of course, is that these lovely unidirectional arrows that we had coming out of genetics are now bidirectional arrows here in the middle, because if a gene changes in expression associated with amyloid or with Alzheimer's, you might think that maybe that gene is causing amyloid. Maybe it goes up with amyloid, so it's causing amyloid. So you'd like to repress this gene. Or maybe that gene goes up in response to amyloid, and maybe it actually fights amyloid to bring it back down. So maybe you would like to actually overexpress that gene to combat the disease. Or maybe it's just correlated for no reason, um, you know, just chance, chance. It just happens to be that there's a bunch of factors that both increase amyloid and also increase the expression of that gene for a completely independent reason. Or it could be that there's an environmental factor that impacts both, or that they're both a consequence of the disease rather than a cause of the disease. To understand this, what we need to do is actually build new methods similar to Mendelian randomization that utilize genetics to figure out the causal component of that correlation and actually bring the unidirectionality of these arrows back. So we've developed such methods in the context of the ROSMAP study. The ROSMAP cohort was assembled by David Bennett at Rush University and by Phil de Jaeger, uh, with, who, with whom we've been collaborating initially at HMN, and he's now in Colombia. And what we can do is basically start profiling the post-mortem brains of hundreds of individuals to understand how epigenomic variation in these brains, but also transcriptional variation, relate with phenotypic variation for those individuals and also with the genetics of each of the individuals to discover, number one, genetic variants that impact transcription or methylation. 
So these are methylation QTLs or expression QTLs. These are quantitative trait loci. These are the, so quantitative trait simply means just like height is quantitative rather than you're tall or you're short with a binary threshold. So quantitative trait and then expression quantitative trait basically means that the quantitative trait that we're gonna be looking at is not gonna be height, it's gonna be expression of a particular gene. So and then locus of course means genetic locus. So an EQTL, an expression quantitative trait locus is a genetic variant or a genetic region that impacts the expression of a nearby gene. So let's now look number one for correlation between genetic variation and epigenomics in order to build this unidirectional causal model because genetics is not impacted by the disease but it only impacts the disease, especially for common variants. And then look at the correlation between epigenomic variation and disease and use the two to establish causality of the genetic variants onto the disease phenotypes. So first of all, let's look at this arrow here of how genetic variation correlates with epigenomics. We can look for genetic variants that predispose you to higher or lower uh, levels of methylation at a particular locus. And indeed, we find 50,000 such variants. These are, uh, you know, this is like an overlaid Manhattan plot for every gene in the genome. And what we're finding is that the p-values here are astronomical. 10 to the minus 8 is, you know, down here. And then the genome-wide bone ferronic corrected line is the red line that you see here at the bottom. And this goes all the way down up to 10 to the minus 300 in terms of significance. That means that if I know your genotype at birth, I can actually predict your epigenome at 93 years of age in an inaccessible organ like the brain. And if we do that systematically, we can actually start building this G2M correlation, which is actually a causal relationship where if I know your genetics, I can predict your methylation. Why is that exciting? Because that's a much smaller, uh, that requires many fewer individuals because it's a much more oligogenic trait than G2D which requires tens of thousands of people. And moreover, this allows us to carry out a methylome-wide association study. So instead of looking for GWAS, gene-wide association study, we can look at the correlation between methylation variation and disease. And that is a bidirectional arrow, which I can only do in a small number of individuals, primarily because people are not as generous about donating their brain before they're done using it. With blood, you can actually look at epigenomic association for tens of thousands of individuals, but humans kind of like to hold on to their brain while they're alive. So you need post-mortem brains of hundreds of people. And that association is now bi-directional because you don't know if the methylation changes are a result of the disease or if they're in fact causing disease. However, by combining this G2M arrow, which is unidirectional, we can predict methylation rather than just observe methylation. And if we can predict methylation genetically, that's actually even better than methylation. That's imputed methylation, but that's the genetic component of methylation. So not all of methylation, but just the genetically driven methylation. And if we can correlate that genetically driven methylation with disease, we now have causality back. We can now start predicting disease through the predicted methylation across tens of thousands of individuals because we only need the genetics of these people. So doing this, we can basically go in chromosomes that previously had only six different associations or none of which were genome-wide significant to now find many associations that are, are genome-wide significant after both for any correction, which is the red dashed line here. So that basically gives us a new handle for discovering additional genetic loci that are now associated with the disease by combining multiple SNPs to predict methylation level, which is then associated with disease. And we can do that not just with methylation, but also with transcription and both of them together to understand the causal mediators that mediate the genetic effect of the disease on of the genetic variants onto disease through methylation and through transcription. So doing this in Alzheimer's disease, we basically find that there are dozens of additional loci that do not reach genome-wide significance that are now genome-wide significant through this mediation analysis. So we're finding both uh, genome-wide significant loci in uh, purple that uh, are either positively or negatively associated with disease. So that suggests, you know, protective versus risk-inducing expression and gives us a directionality for intervening as well. 
it, the size of the circle tells us how much heritability we capture in each locus. And then we have the identity of the gene, which is a likely target gene in these loci. And we also have in gray, many additional loci that do not reach genome-wide significance, but yet we can tell are uh, enormously important. So we can now do this at the single cell level. Up until now, I've been basically telling you about these brain associations, uh, with this you know, combining genetic, epigenetic, and expression variation to find these mediators in brain. But brain is composed of you know, many, many different cell types. And we'd like to now start dissecting that. So we've been busy over the last few years. We basically now started profiling um, many different disorders of brain at single cell resolution. We now have uh, 1,500 individuals that we basically profiled across more than a dozen different phenotypes, including Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, ALS, Huntington's, psychosis in AD, schizophrenia, bipolar, Down syndrome, autism, depression, suicide, PTSD, aging, and I'm missing a few. And for each of those, we're basically finding all of the major cell types, up to 30 different brain cell types in some of the studies, and you know, 7.5 million cells across all in individuals. And we're profiling RNA as well as DNA accessibility for each of those, and in some cases across multiple regions of the brain. So this is the first study. This, this was published in collaboration with Li Hui Tai in Nature last year. And we basically have profiled 84,000 cells Every dot is a different cell across 48 individuals, 24 with no Alzheimer's, and then another 24 with both mild and severe Alzheimer's disease. The first thing we're finding is that variation is primarily driven by cell type. This clustering using this T statistics, stochastic neighbor embedding or TSNI, uh, as well as ActionNet, a, a paper that we just published three days ago to basically understand the um, uh, layout and the cell type identification, the cell state associated with each of these uh, experiments. What we're finding is that, uh, you know, the first component variation is number one, the cell type, but number two, if you look within excitatory neurons, this subset here comes from individuals that have Alzheimer's and that subset comes from individuals that don't. That basically tells us that the global expression patterns are in fact shifting in the context of disease. To study that systematically, we basically classified all of the cell types and then we subdivided each of the cell types into subclusters that are learned completely de novo. And what was striking is that these subclusters are in fact extremely associated with high or low amyloid, with early or late BRAC stages, with strong or little cognitive decline, with Alzheimer's or non-Alzheimer's diagnosis. So that basically means that Alzheimer's is in fact a major driver of global gene expression patterns in the disease state. The second surprise was that uh, sex was in fact an, an enormously associated with sick, quote unquote, or healthy cells. Female individuals had many, many more cells from the disease associated subclusters, whereas male individuals have many fewer cells. So that suggests that women have a much stronger transcriptional level pathology than men. That basically when you look at Alzheimer's disease, they're much more affected at the transcriptional level. And what's really remarkable is that our individuals were matched for both cognitive and for um, pathological phenotypes in their brain, suggesting that perhaps women are more resilient. Even though their transcriptional patterns are very strongly altered, they are um, you know, somehow able to mitigate this uh, through other ways. We also found that early changes in Alzheimer's were extremely cell type specific, whereas late changes were much more uh, shared across cell types. And these were very often involving genes associated with stress. We found that there are 3000 genes that are differentially expressed between uh, male and female individuals for non-AD, but with AD, you have 6,000 genes that are differentially expressed. So that basically means that men are indeed from Mars and women are from Venus, but they become even further apart in their own planets after disease strikes. So that means that therapeutically, we shouldn't be thinking of disease as monolithic. We should be actually tailoring it to the specifics of each individual and each sex. We've also profiled a large number of uh, single cell attack data sets. This is accessibility. And indeed you see how cell type specific they are. 
And we've also started linking together uh, variation across cells at the RNA level and at the DNA accessibility level, enabling us to start linking non-coding variations, which are the variants that are so associated with disease that are shown here in black with the target genes that they might be controlling based on the correlation of uh, RNA expression and uh, enhancer activity across uh, sets of cells. How do we do that? By basically co-aligning RNA and attack cells uh, individually in the same space and relating that with, of course, the cell types of each of these cells, enabling us to now link together sets of cells across both their RNA and their attack profile to study this correlation systematically. What we're finding is, in fact, there are coordinated changes that are happening between single cell RNA and single cell attack. If you look at, for example, APOE in microglia, you see that it increases in expression in disease, and indeed it increases in accessibility as well. And similarly for genes in uh, neur neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, you see this correlation between DNA accessibility and RNA expression. Looking at this systematically, we find a lot of genes where the two are very strongly correlated, where you see these diagonal arrows where uh, the individual's expression is both increasing and their accessibility is increasing in the context of disease, which is where the arrow is pointing. But you also see other examples where accessibility doesn't change, but indeed expression increases, and these are possibly poised enhancers and so on and so forth. We have also been looking at the somatic mutations that we can infer directly from this <clears throat> uh, single cell RNA sequencing. So we can basically use uh, SmartSeq, which is sequencing the entire transcript, to call somatic mutations based on the germline sequencing of the same pairs of individuals, of the paired individuals. And then what we're finding is that glial cells are in fact showing many more mutations at the somatic level than neurons. And then that's because they're post mitotic, the, the, the neurons are post mitotic, so the, the, they're not dividing as much and mutations accumulate less. But we're also finding a class of disease associated neurons that are showing many more mutations than the normal neurons. We're also able to distinguish uh, differences in the number of mutations between amyloid and no amyloid, and also between men and women. And within each of the cell types, we're able to now start converging these mutations across many individuals into a score for every cell and ev for every cell type and every gene in that cell type, enabling us to, to pinpoint specific biological pathways associated with Alzheimer's somatic mutations uh, in each of those cases. We've uh, you know, scaled up uh, traumatically. We've now gone to many additional uh, regions and we've gone to many phenotypes. So basically, if you look at uh, schizophrenia, this paper was just submitted last week. Hopefully it will be on BioArchive within a day or two. Um, and what we're finding is that there are many differentially expressed genes in schizophrenia falling in pathways that are associated with inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons. We're finding specifically a class of excitatory neurons that is associated with transcriptional resilience. Uh, the individuals that carry that one cell type are in fact much more likely to show normal expression pattern, even if they are schizophrenic to start with. And we're also finding that the regulators upstream of all of these pathways that are altered are in fact playing roles both in early development and in synaptic functions, connecting these two previously separate components of schizophrenia. For ALS and FTD, which are very common, even though they impact the frontal or the motor cortex separately, we're finding a, 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 you know, these um, you know, very different uh, associations, this very large number of cell types, and we're finding changes in endocytosis, apoptosis, regulation, differentiation, and signaling for ALS, and then regulation, neurodevelopment, uh, neurodegeneration, energy, and synaptic functions in uh, FTD. Uh, and you know, a large number of genes uh, associated with those. For Huntington's disease, we're finding that these indirect pathway spiny projection neurons and these direct pathway spiny projection neurons that have very distinct identities and controls are in fact losing their distinct identities in Huntington's disease, which is uh, you know, also confirmed in mouse and then reinforces that finding, suggesting that there's global changes 
in uh, those cell types. Looking across different brain regions, we can basically now build pseudotype models for how is disease progressing across brain regions for the same individual, across individuals, but also across cells of the same region. And we basically now started building these pseudotype models, enabling us to see when is each gene peaking in expression associated with disease pathology. We're also able to associate the local pathology that we're measuring in each brain region with a distinct set of genes that is altered in each of those regions. And you can see here an example of how much is astrocyte variation uh, changing across different regions of the brain. You can see that these cortical versus subcortical regions are in fact dramatically different in their expression patterns, even for a cell type like astrocytes that you would not expect to change as much as neurons. We're also finding that the single cell expression patterns are in fact capturing spatial information that if you look within the hippocampus, you find that the subicular structure and you know, CA1, CA2, uh, the dentate gyrus are in fact showing very distinct expression patterns enabling us to infer spatial localization information from these directly. And indeed, uh, you see that the genes that are altered in response to each of those are dramatically different. And the CA1 region is in fact one of the most predictive of Alzheimer's, whereas the dentate gyrus is the least predictive. And again, those cells have very different properties, suggesting indeed that the transcriptional pro profiles are recapitulating many of these morphological and also topological differences. We're finding that deep projection uh, neurons are in fact showing very distinct patterns from these you know, more um, low uh, projection. We're also looking at uh, microglia in particular, which are enormously important in Alzheimer's disease. And we're, we've been able to uh, in silico sort 150,000 microglial cells enabling us to now distinguish both inflammatory microglia and synaptic microglia. So what that allows us to do is now start even for microglia, which have been associated with perhaps uh, through the complement function, both schizophrenia, and of course, through many different pathways, Alzheimer's, we can now actually see that the synaptic microglia are the only ones that show different expression in schizophrenia. And they're the only ones that show localization of genetic variants with schizophrenia in their accessible regions. Whereas for inflammatory uh, microglia, this is exactly what, what is being affected in Alzheimer's, both at the genetic and at the gene expression level. So we've been able to also integrate the single cell data to deconvolve bulk expression across thousands of individuals and start predicting the specific changes that are happening in both composition of these cell types, as well as their genetic effects. You see neuronal loss, as well as astrocyte gain as individuals age, and also between AD and non-AD. And we're also finding genetic variants that are associated with gene expression composition, with the cell type composition. Uh, and here's one example of the TMM106B gene, which is associated with FTLD, but not associated with, L with AD, but in fact, uh, this is affecting the neuronal fraction is in fact strongly associated with cognition, suggesting that it acts through the gene expression, uh, the gene, uh, the cell type composition changes. We've also been doing a lot of work in looking at the multiple phenotypes of Alzheimer's, looking at neuritic plaques versus neurofibrillary tangles versus neuroinflammation, and then using that to partition the genome according to the subset of regions that are, that are methylated differentially in each of those phenotypes. And indeed we're finding that these specific subsets are painting very different genotology terms. So by partitioning the disease phenotypes, we can in fact recognize distinct pathways as well as cell types that are associated with these uh, combinations. So we've expanded that to electronic health records, basically start understanding systematically the comorbidity patterns of these individuals, building a model across prescription, uh, ICD-9 billing codes, lab tests, DRG codes, and doctor notes, this hierarchical model that allows us to now group individuals into subclasses and start number one, cleaning up the clinical record, which is extremely sparsely populated, but number two, associating these subclasses of individuals with genetic variants that are associated with expression changes through GTEx, the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, and show that these uh, post-transcriptional, sorry, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is in fact associated with uh, 
blood expression changes rather than brain expression changes, consistent with an immune basis also for PTSD. In the context of obesity, we've now started looking at multiple different tissues. So plasma, heart, liver, cortex, small intestine, and different types of fat and triceps to basically start understanding both in human and in mouse, how are uh, different diets and also different amounts of exercise affecting the single cell expression pattern for each of those. And we're able to now start uh, inferring the immune cells that are sitting in each of those tissues. And we're finding that these immune pathways are playing a central role in the gene expression changes that are happening. We're able to predict receptors and signaling proteins and their, through their expression pa patterns to basically understand the interplay between these tissues. And we've also been using this um, multi-tissue approach to understand biomarkers of both aging and cancer in uh, the blood and understand the convergence of these distant genes into common targets in cancer, as well as understanding longitudinally how uh, the lineages that are coexisting in each individual, in a single individual, are in fact progressing through treatment. Lastly, we're developing a lot of technologies for testing this systematically through DCAS9 and activation or repression, as well as editing and knockout and then carrying this out in iPSCs and then differentiating them into different cell types to basically understand how these are changing systematically. And we've also built a lot of technologies, for example, Hydra, that combines attack capture of accessible regions with StarSeq developed by Alex Stark over at IMP, a common friend of Yuli and mine, uh, who's basically allowing you to have self-transcribing constructs through these accessible regions Across, in order to carry out 7 million tests in a single experiment, and then be able to localize in high resolution the regions that are driving this enhancer activity. And then in collaboration with Andrea Fenning, another former postdoc in my lab, who's now a professor at CMU, we're looking into testing these tens of thousands of variants in these massively parallel reporter assay constructs in the brains of mice, to basically understand how they're acting in the context of all these other cell types. So that's all I have to say, sorry for running a little over, uh, but we're basically building these reference epigenomes, looking at how they vary in the context of disease and genetic variation, looking at how they change between cell types at the single cell level, building these cell type specific genetic networks, looking at multiple phenotypes simultaneously, and then looking at multiple tissues and how disease is converging across them. And then lastly, building these high throughput dissection tools. Uh, this is a series of collaborations, uh, very generous funding from NIH and from foundations and an awesome set of individuals. And many of them have now started independent faculty positions and we're looking for postdocs. If you're listening and you're looking for a postdoc, let me know. And that's where I'll stop and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manolis. That was fun. Thank you. you so I, have a, I have two questions here already. Or I have three questions, in fact. So uh, let me start. <clears throat> Augusto. Yes, let's get, huh? Uh, oh, you can see them also? Me. Okay, you can read them aloud if you yeah. want. Okay, Augusto sure. is asking, thanks for the talk. Very nice reminder of exciting times we're living in biology. Thank you, Augusto. How do you envision we will be associating RNA processing, post-translational changes, and subcellular compartmentalization with the associations that your team has discovered? Oh, boy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an enormous question. And my answer is, the more you can capture genomically, the better. If you can basically build probes associated with a particular post-translational change or a particular subcellular compartment, and then use these probes to tag either RNAs or proteins or anything that allows you to then get a high throughput readout, more power to you. So that, that's sort of where my excitement is. Basically, anything that we can measure using genomic technologies at scale can be integrated. If you can't measure it, it's hard to integrate it. So, you know, one cell at a time or a few cells at a time, is much harder. Once you've developed the insights from the sort of small data approach, you can then turn to how do we measure them systematically in big data. I, I really want you guys to keep asking these questions. So just type them in and I will answer them. So Amaral Danielson is asking, nice talk and nice data about the genes that you found RNA upregulation but unchanged chromatin openness. Have you looked at AP transcriptomics or any mutations that could affect mRNA stability? So we have a paper that's now uh, in review in Nature Genetics on MP transcriptomics. We basically have this M6A profiling of uh, something like 150 individuals across multiple different tissues in the context of the GTEx cohort. 
We've basically now combined uh, EGTEX, which is enhancing GTEx, with GTEx, uh, and looked at chromatin variation across tissues and individuals, but also uh, M6A post-transcriptional um, uh, modifications. And indeed, we're finding that some GWAS loci that are not associated with expression change are indeed associated with M6A differences. So uh, yeah, this could account for some of the, you know, upregulation but unchanged chromatin through the effect of M6A on RNA stability and degradation, but this could also, um, you know, be through other means. So uh, great question. Epitranscriptomics is super important and we're looking into that. Afzal Zainab is asking, you showed that the transcriptional profile in women was worse than men in Alzheimer's, but that got me curious if there's a gender bias in the activity of enhancers to affect transcriptional outputs. My guess is that indeed the epigenomic activity is probably correlated with transcriptional activity across sexes. We haven't specifically looked for how this changes, but there's absolutely no reason why sex would be behaving differently from any other variable where we do find that uh, epigenomics and transcriptomics is correlated. Well, it could uh, be influenced by hormones, right? So they're acting at a level of transcription, so they could affect enhanced activity. Absolutely. So we're, we, we now have an active collaboration uh, with uh, the Thai lab on sex-specific differences, and we're looking at the expression of uh, hormones and the expression of hormone receptors and how they change with sex. And what we're finding indeed is that there's a lot of variability between sexes, not just in the sex hormones themselves that are permeating the body, but also in the receptor uh, the expression for these hormones. So, uh, you know, I'm guessing that this is one of the ways that this is mediated. So there's two, there's two ways. One of them is from the cell itself, based on the presence of the extra, extra chromosome and the differential uh, inhibition and silencing of uh, the X and also the genes on the Y and how they're affecting the local circuitry of every cell, but also through these receptors and the hormonal signaling. So, you know, super, super important uh, question. Keep coming. This is the last question, unless you ask more. So you have 30 seconds. A central assumption in this analysis is that transcript level predicts change in protein level. To what extent is this true? This analysis informing the consequences of disease or the effects that precipitated the disease? Um, so two questions, both of them super important and super awesome. So the first one is, why aren't you looking at protein level instead? And remember what I was saying earlier, if you can measure it, you can study it. If we could measure protein level systematically across all of those, I would love to relate protein abundance to transcriptional level systematically across all of this. Um, it's not yet possible. We don't have the tools for doing this at the same scale as single cell RNA transcription. Uh, there's another complication, which is you know, equally embarrassing as, hey, we're not looking at protein. We're not looking even at all RNA because this is a post-transcriptional human brain. These cells are extremely intertwined with each other. You can't just simply like pull out a neuron with all of its uh, you know, axons and dendrites and, you know, um, infer all of the transcripts that are sitting throughout it. The only thing we have access to is actually nuclei because these are easy to sort of, you know, um, process just simply where the data is. So of course, we're looking at a tiny subset of the transcriptome uh, and perhaps, you know, the uh, ER is, um, you know, pulling down uh, the endosomic reticulum is actually being pulled down along with the nuclei within these bubbles for uh, of drop seek uh, for uh, labeling. So we're capturing a small part of the RNA and only RNA, not protein. And yet we're finding these awesome correlations and insights. So there's two, two ways to go. One is we could stop working on it and just wait until the technology gets there. You know, not the, great, uh, not, not, not the greatest choice because uh, in order for the technology to get there, we have to show that the biology matters. And in order to push forward with the biology, we need to work with the current technology. So more studies with existing technology push forward the field and help get better technology in place. All we can do is simply write in every one of our papers, and we try to do that, that there are caveats and there are limitations and we're not measuring protein level. And you know that's in fact uh, a great caveat. There's been a lot of studies of how predictive is RNA for protein. You know, some of them say it's great, some of them say bad. They're both showing the same correlation and it's not a perfect correlation, but there is very strong correlation there. And what transcriptional studies do is that they, they bring you a little closer 
to the transcriptional regulation and the CIS regulatory control, which is something that Yuli and I, and, and I know many of you care a lot about. So transcription has its advantages and has its disadvantages, but mostly it's what we can measure. The second is, is the analysis informing the consequences of the, disease, of the disease or the events that precipitated the disease? And it's a combination. Well, the analysis that I showed with the genetically mediated methylation or genetically mediated expression gets at that difference. And one of the things that we're doing is looking at what is the overall expression, what is the genetically driven and genetically predicted expression, and what is the delta between the two? If I can predict something genetically, that might be the genetic component. If I can't, that might be the environmental quote unquote component. That might be the consequence of the disease component. So we can actually start partitioning these expression changes into genetically driven versus environment plus disease driven. And we have a lot of environmental variables for these individuals. So we are actually trying to tease that apart right now. So hugely interesting question. I would love to talk with you more about that. Randall Hoffman has another question. The previous one was by KSI. I don't know what that means. Uh, if, you have, if you can type your name, I will say your name. So Randall is asking, I loved your talk, but it made a cure for, for example, Alzheimer's seem further away than ever. I'm sorry, it is true that this is enormously complicated as you've reinforced the complexity of the disease. How do you see through the morass? I'm sorry, my English is not that good. If you can translate morass, that would be great and find a single causal thing to focus efforts on. Or does it suggest that it's hopelessly multifactorial at the most basic level, and instead we should be focusing on symptom management. So let me uh, ponder a little bit on, on this question. So polygenicity basically means that there are thousands of contributors. That's something that we've known for a while. There's not gonna be a gene for Alzheimer's and a gene for obesity. It's, it's ridiculous to think that way. And I'm sorry that so much of uh, genetics has basically oversold this idea that, oh, we're just gonna crack it, we're gonna find the gene and then we're gonna be over. Like we got the gene for cancer. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous. Um, however, convergence is one of my favorite concepts in biology and in the study of disease. What does convergence mean? Convergence basically means that even though there actually might be many, or there actually are many, many factors, these factors are converging on a small set of intertwined pathways. This intertwining basically means that, um, that <laughs> sorry, uh, this intertwining of these pathways basically means that um, if we, so the, the example that I like to give with obesity is the following. You have a giant bathtub that's filled with fat or water. And there's a lot of stuff putting in and a lot of, there's a lot of stuff bringing things out. All that matters is just how much fat sits in that bathtub. And if we can figure out all of the little knobs, there might be hundreds of knobs, but ultimately they're just one bathtub. And if we figure out that genetic variation gives you a tiny little dial that changes one of these knobs, either in the output or in the input by a tiny amount, we can go in pharmaceutically and change that thing and then either stop the influx or more easily start the efflux. And the efflux, you know, poking a hole in that bathtub, doesn't matter if there's like a thousand components filling it, there's still one giant hole that's emptying it out. The way that I see disease uh, is that there's not just one bathtub per disease, but maybe there's like 20 bathtubs. There, there's 20 pathways that are associated with the pathophysiology of every disease. And if we can understand the thousands of knobs that are controlling these 20 pathways and how they're converging into those pathways, we can basically figure out ways to poke holes into the different pathways and how to modulate them and then understand their interactions and their combinatorics. But then we finally have a handle on the true causal factions of the disease, uh, factors of the disease. So yes, it's a little depressing because we understand the complexity, but for those of us who kind of assumed that the complexity was there, it's extremely exhilarating because we now have a handle on understanding that complexity. So yes, we now know that the denominator of how much we don't know is enormous, but the numerator has gotten a lot better of how much we actually do know. So the fraction may have not gotten any better, but at least the numerator is increasing at a tremendous pace. So yes, we understand more, number one. And number two, yes, there might be thousands of factors, but there's only a small number of pathways on which your, uh, those factors are converging. So how do you see through the morass and find a single causal thing to focus in on? Or does it suggest that it's hopelessly multifactorial and instead we should focus on symptom management? No, no, no. I don't think that we should be focusing on symptom management. 
And we've spent all of humanity doing that. We've spent all of humanity working on correlation. Epidemiology has always been correlation based. The word causation has been a bad word in epidemiology for a long time. But with genetic epidemiology, it's different. We now understand the difference between correlation, which is all the things that change beyond the genetic component, and causation, which is that genetic component. By understanding the causes, we can actually go after the beginning of the disease rather than just fighting the fires, we can actually find the arsonists and get rid of the arsonists. And I think that that's sort of my view of where we should be going with all this. Yes, of course, managing the symptoms is important, but if we can understand the causes and if we can intervene early on, we can actually have a better outcome overall. And then KSI was COSIC C. That's where I'll stop. Yuli, I don't know if there's any uh, other questions that you have or any sort of topics that you want I, to speak more about. Plenty of questions, but I'll ask them later because we're running out of time. Um, okay. But that's great. So I think your, your answer is it's essentially in the middle. So you can't fix all the little mutations and you also shouldn't just uh, look at these uh, symptoms, but that's somewhere in between the really good knobs to turn. Yeah. That we can, and and yeah. it's perfectly fine for different pharmaceutical companies to have drugs working on one or another or a third or a fourth point of convergence. Ultimately, what the doctors will prescribe is perhaps tailored to each person. Maybe we, you know, and that was my section on the EHR and the sort of neuroinflammation versus tau versus A beta, et cetera. There are different parts of the genome that are associated with these uh, sub phenotypes of Alzheimer's. We can't just think of Alzheimer's as a monolithic disorder. You can't just say, oh, this person has Alzheimer's, let's give the same drug. This other person has Alzheimer's, let's give the same drug. Perhaps this person has more signatures of neuroinflammation and more signatures of tau, but less signatures of A-beta. And this other person has a different combination of these signatures. And if you look at Alzheimer's, we're finding convergence in lipid processing, in immune functions, in synaptic functions, in neuronal functions. The more you move towards uh, rare variants and somatic variants, the more you move towards the neurons but the common variants are sort of much more on the microglia side and inflammatory side. So you can basically uh, tune, tune the combination of therapeutics to each person based on the specific combination of genetic variants that they have. You can think of polygenic risk score measurements rather than just saying, let's do that for Alzheimer's. You can basically say, let's take the subset of your PRS, your polygenic risk score that is lying within lipid pathways and within immune pathways and so on and so forth. And you can actually predict a risk for each person that is tailored to the convergence of all of their rare variants and common variants into each of these knobs. And you can basically sort of prescribe a combination of these that is tailored to each person. So in my view, that's where, that's where personalized medicine comes in. And the precision medicine comes from understanding these knobs and understanding where are all of these extremely multifactorial factors converging. So I wouldn't say they find a single causal thing. No, no, every company will find a single causal thing. But together across the field, we have to point what are the points of convergence. And then, you know, as you're strategizing in, you know, the next pharmaceutical meeting, what should we go after? You can basically say, okay, well, Pfizer has this and, you know, I don't know, um, um, Novartis has that and so on and so forth. So let's focus on this one that neither, that neither of them have, for example, if your goal is to better disease overall, or you can basically say, well, let's focus on the same exact ones because that's what everybody does. Uh, all right, there's the last question. Uh, Randall says, thank you and Sriram, what do you think about tackling cancers based on these approaches? The tricky part about cancer is that causal events may not be relevant to disease outcomes after cell acquires full blown hallmark. So we are working on cancer progression through immunotherapy. We have basically a cohort of hundred uh, individuals, both pre and post treatment and single cell profiles of before treatment and during treatment and after treatment. And, um, you know, again, what we're finding is this, you know, wholly factorial, but convergence into a small number of pathways and this enormous role of immune pathways, both uh, in the traditional immune cells as well as in the tumor itself. Uh, but the challenge, of course, with cancer is that it's dramatically different from common disease. So common disease is all about purifying selection and common variants and rare variants. Whereas cancer is all about positive selection and sort of having the predisposition of each person interpreted in the context of the positive selection events that are happening on the way to the accumulation of these hallmarks. So um, the, the, the saving grace, however, is again, convergence. So when I showed the, the cancer uh, work, when I flashed it, I basically showed all these arrows that are converging onto the same um, sort of pathways. And what's really happening there is that every person has a different set of mutations. 
but you can think of it as an evolutionary process. This cancer needs to acquire these hallmarks, these sort of talisman, these sort of capabilities, if you wish. And the way to acquire them is extremely multifactorial. You can acquire them you know, in many different paths. Every cancer chooses a different path. The specific mutation is gonna be different. The specific enhancer might be different. The specific gene itself might be different, but ultimately they're converging into a common set of pathways. So that's the place to now go, you know, go focus on. What, what are these points of convergence even for cancer? Even if it's common variants, rare variants, somatic variants, there's still convergence. Even in Alzheimer's with our somatic variants, we found convergence, convergence, convergence. So that's ultimately what's happening. All right, we'll stop there. I see Yulia panicking. She's German, I'm Greek, so Thank very big difference. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding myself back. But you do have a virtual lunch with the students, so I don't want to take time away from Of course, you. of course. But that's oh, part of the lunch anyway. Fun. Yeah, so join the students' lunch. And Thank we'll you so you. much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Thanks, send bye. me emails. Talk to me. Apply. It's, uh, it's, it's exciting to, to meet people and to talk with people. And I'm sorry I don't get to actually see you, but don't be a stranger. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Do we stay at the Zoom for the lunch? No, you have to uh, click on something else.